Fox fans. Are you ready? You are listening to the Ducks and Pucks podcast with your hosts, Mike Walters and Eddie Jones. This is the number one home for Anaheim Ducks talk and analysis. Here we go. Well, welcome to the show. This is your host, Mike Walters, along with my co-host, Eddie Jones. And the series of the Ducks and the Sharks is going exactly as Eddie and I called it. It's going to go seven games, right, Eddie? Uh, yeah, <laughs> right. Sure. As everybody, as you all well know, of course you've watched the games. And, well, maybe you didn't watch the last game. But as you all know, the Ducks are down in this series uh, three games to zero after the first three games. Uh, something that... I don't even know if uh, Sharks fans would have predicted this, Eddie, but uh, just not really a good start uh, for the Ducks, and uh, they played better as the series went on. But uh, they, they, you know, what's your initial th- uh, thoughts? They find themselves in this big, you know, three zero. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I'd have to give a lot of credit to the Sharks and the way they came prepared. I felt like they knew their game plan going into the series and how they were going to combat what the Ducks had to offer, and it's worked. It's worked in every single game. I mean, game two was close, but the Sharks were still the better team in that game. And, and then, I mean, game game one, the Ducks were awful. The Sharks took advantage, and, and game game three was just a mess. I mean, the Ducks actually probably played their best hockey of the series in the uh, first period and the first couple minutes of the of the second. Uh, and then they got caught off guard by two odd man rushes by the Sharks, and they just gave up. So it, it's it's disappointing. I don't think anybody. At all, maybe the maybe not even the most optimistic of Sharks fans would have uh, predicted a three nothing series lead for the Sharks at this point, and, and on the the fringe of, of sweeping the Ducks tomorrow. So I don't know. I, I really don't. It it's it's so disappointing because we didn't expect to be in this position, and and you know that game, the eight one loss, is just it's such a an awful scoreline to look at and and it's just so disappointing to see where they're at i mean i thought they'd be a lot more prepared than they have been yeah exactly and we're gonna you know just go over the games a little bit and then uh we'll talk about some roster moves that the ducks uh made uh obviously a lot of fan questions and and i guess more more or less concerns about what's going on especially you know a lot of people assuming that the ducks lose the in regard to uh, what's going to happen with uh, Carlisle and Murray and all kinds of stuff like that. So we'll just go over the games real quick. Uh, you know, don't want to bring back all the nightmares or anything. But I, I think um, the biggest thing, as you touched on in game one, that kind of disappointed me, Eddie, was the way that the Ducks came out in this game. Uh, you know, only four shots in the first period. Uh, you know, they give up uh, the power play goal in the uh, second period, and then it kind of snowballs. They give up a couple more goals <clears throat> later in the period. They get down 3 nothing. But I think what was frustrating about this is so how well the Ducks played down the stretch, you know, winning all those games, going into the playoffs. And then they come out in this game, and they really don't show up until the third period when it's too late. You know, they only get 13 shots in the first, uh, you know, 40 minutes or so, and, and it's already a 3 nothing hole. And it, this team in this game didn't look like the team that we had seen for the last, you know, three, four weeks of the season. No, they didn't. And, um, again... The Sharks did a great job of, of, I mean, they've done it all series, but in this game particularly, they forced the Ducks to the outside. And, uh, you know, the Ducks' bread and butter all season has been getting guys to the front of the net and getting quality chances from the slot, and they just haven't been able to do that in this series because the Sharks have limited their chances, and they've clogged up the neutral zone. And the Ducks haven't been able to enter the zone cleanly, and and a lot of that has been because they haven't had Cam Fowler in the lineup uh, he's the guy who drives the play for the Ducks from from the defensive end, so that's been a huge loss. But yeah, I, I mean, they just they couldn't get anything going. This is like the beginning of what was to come uh, throughout the entire series so far. Is is how well the Sharks were able to set up against the Ducks, and uh, I mean, they they made a I guess you could call it a late push in this game, but it was too much. None, none of the chances they got on Martin Jones are really that quality chances that you would uh, expect them to go in the back of the net. I believe Kessler hit the post. And the only real quality slot chance the Ducks had in this entire game. So they weren't cashing it. I mean, they had a couple chances here and there that they didn't cash it on. And, and it was a, a big reason why they ended up losing 3 nothing. Yeah, I agree. I, I think another factor, too, is, is like you said, was the neutral zone. You know, the Sharks blocked 20 shots in this game. So even shots that the Ducks are trying to get on net weren't even getting there. 
Uh, like you said, uh, you know, moving the puck between the red lines was extremely difficult. Ducks only ended up getting 25 shots on net. Um, just there wasn't a whole lot of good to talk about this game. I mean, it was just unfortunate the way they came out, <clears throat> you know, flat-footed basically. And, you know, the Ducks then in uh, game two, uh, it, it seemed good in the beginning. You know, Silverberg scored 40 seconds in. Uh, things looked good. Uh, you know, the Sharks countered in the middle of the period. Uh, and then, of course, they got a power play goal later as well. They built a two to one lead and a three to one lead. Uh, the Ducks were able to get a power play goal back, and you know it, it looked like they might have had a chance in game two. Um, you know, both teams had power play goals. You know, the faceoffs were almost dead even. Uh, you know, at least the Ducks start off better, but they you know kind of fell apart a little bit towards the end of the first period, and you know ultimately they lost this one three to two. I mean, it was a game. Of the three, obviously the best that they played as far as the whole three periods. But, uh, you know, they came up short. Maybe could have gone to overtime in this game. Um, but after they uh, got that first goal, they, um, you know, just kind of made some some undisciplined, you know, penalties here and there, which kind of been the theme, too. We saw that in game one. We saw that in this game. And then, of course, in game three, which we'll get to in a minute. But what did you think about game two, Eddie? I mean, it started out all right. But then, of course, you know, they came up short by a goal. Yeah, I think the theme of the series so far, uh, two big things stick out for me. The Sharks have played extremely well defensively. They've played a they played very strong in front of Martin Jones, wherein he hasn't had to make any highlight reel saves. And when he's been called upon, he's been good. And the other thing for me is the Sharks have capitalized on pretty much all the chances that they've gotten. They have been extremely efficient in front of the net. Uh, and, and yes, some of the plays... They've got lucky on, like this Mark, Marcus Sorison goal in Game 2, the first one. It bounces off the boards, goes right to him, and he's essentially alone. I think he's the only guy that was really there thinking that would come off the boards. Not much Gibby could do. But then you look at the next goal here, too, by uh, by Logan Couture. Uh, it's a two-on-one. He's in alone, and he's able to make a, a play and cash in. And that, that sparked a, <laughs> where we had seen a, three identical goals in each of these games. I forget who scored it in the first goal. I think it was Evander Kane in the first game, Logan yeah, Couture in the second game, and Marcus Sorensen in game three, where they're all two-on-ones, where they would pull it to the back end and score. Not much Gibby can do on those, but again, they're cashing in on their chances. It was unfortunate that that power play... Uh, came at what was considered a ghost penalty by Brandon yes. Montour, where he was called yes. for hooking. But, I mean, you can't really blame the officiating, officiating in, in this series at all. I, I know it's disappointing that that ends up leading to a goal, because it, it really shouldn't have been a penalty, but the Ducks have got away with a couple things in the series as well. And the Sharks made them pay, ultimately. I mean, the Ducks' penalty kill, which has been a strength for them all season, hasn't been good. The Sharks' power play has woke up without Joe Thornton, because they've been able to cash in on the, the chances that they've had. And then again, you've got uh, Thomas Hurdle, who just breaks through three Ducks players, victimizes Brandon Montour, and throws it back against the grain on John Gibson, who maybe bet a little bit hard that uh, he wasn't going to get the shot off. But again, you can't really blame him. But, you know, as a, as a whole, this, this game was probably the best for the Ducks. You know, they still got outplayed, and the Sharks still, you know, they still um, play, did very well in executing their system. Uh, but it, it gave us some some positive signs for Game Three. It really did. I, I felt like the Ducks were getting back into this series. You know, the goals they scored weren't really highlight real goals. The Jakob Silver one was kind of an early one on Martin Jones where he was sleeping a bit. The the second one by Lindholm was because Dylan ended up running into Martin Jones. But at least the Ducks were capitalizing some of the chances they had. Uh, but a whole, I I don't think we expected what was to come. I, I mean, this looked positive, and then you go into Game Three and. Nobody expected what was going to happen. Yeah, I mean, game three, you know, the Sharks scored first. Uh, again, the Ducks got a power play goal, uh, you know, by Raquel. This time, you know, it was one-to-one -one after the first period. They looked good. You know, you, you felt like they, you know, had a chance in this game. I yeah. mean, you know, the opening 20 minutes, uh, they're moving the puck. They're, they're doing the things that they need to do. And then two quick goals within about two and a half minutes in the beginning of the second period. The Sharks go up three to one. And then basically all hell breaks loose after this point. The Sharks end up getting two more in that period. Uh, the Ducks, um, I hate to say it, but they pretty much go goon it up in this game. I mean, yep. they, they let frustration get to them. 
<laughs> they started taking all kinds of crazy penalties. Uh, Getzloff gets a double minor. Perry gets a penalty. Getzloff's, you know, chewing out the refs left and right. He gets booted from the game. Kessler takes a penalty at the end. Uh, you know, the big three basically took stupid penalties, let's be real. Yeah. And they're all frustrated. And it just it led to, you know, and I'm sure some of you probably turned off the game. I, I, I don't blame you. I mean, the Ducks ended up losing this one 8-1. to one. Um, You know, I, I don't know. I And that's why I tweeted out I had no, nothing to say after the game because I – I was just so frustrated, and and basically, I just stopped looking at social media after this game because I already knew that there's nothing good that's going to come from reading anybody's comments on social media after this game. Obviously, we all know that the Ducks started the game fine, blew it in the second period, and then, of course, even tanked it even worse in the third. And, you know, uh, they're down 3 nothing. I mean, there's, there wasn't much to say after that game. I mean, I knew you and I were going to do the podcast, and I was sitting here going – I'm just going to save it for the podcast because this game, I, I think the thing that disappointed me the most, and even Carlisle touched on it. If you didn't see it, he had a little press conference after practice. Um, he just talked about the emotion and that, you know, that things went wrong in the beginning of the second period. And instead of responding to it in the right way, they didn't. Instead, they started trying to, you know, beat the crap, you know, for lack of a better term. Uh, out of the Sharks, and you can't do that. I mean, like you said earlier, they've been beating them on the two-on-ones and these breakaways and the speed. They've been clogging up the special teams. A lot of the stuff you and I talked about in the game, um, or excuse me, in the series preview, yeah. is come true. And and this game was just, you know, honestly, Eddie, I, I, I'd have to look back at every single playoff game that this team's been involved in, and... I was talking this over with a few other people, including uh, uh, Phil Hewlett, too. We were talking about this after the game. I think, unless someone else out there knows something I don't, I think this game was the worst playoff loss in the entire history of the Ducks. That's how bad this game was. At. Yeah, I, I, I'd i have to look back, and, and you could maybe put in some of last year's Game 6 and a couple of the Game 7s, but as for the scoreline and the magnitude right, right. of the game and the fact that the Ducks had pretty much, I think, won the last three or four that when they were down 2-0 in a series, uh, they'd won game three, and <clears throat> they, they they looked good. Uh, I mean, you know, Couture gets a goal on the Sharks' first shot, and again, it's a defensive miscue by Getzlaff and Montour. Montour told Getzlaff to watch Couture coming in. Getzlaff either doesn't see him or doesn't listen to him, <laughs> and uh, Couture is wide, wide, wide open in front of the net, and, and again, you can't blame John Gibson on this one, because what's he supposed to do? I mean, Couture has half a net to throw it into, because it was a great pass by Mikel Bodker to get it over to him, but, you know, that that's the Sharks again capitalizing on the chances they have. Gibson comes up strong again on the Sharks' second shot on goal, which was a breakaway by Chris Tierney, yeah. so Gibson yeah. was strong in the game, but I mean, looking back even to, like you said, the series preview we had, we'd given the Sharks the edge on offense, that's come true, the, the Sharks' depth and, and the amount of playmaking options they have up front, even without Joe Thornton, has been too much for the Ducks. We gave them the edge on special teams, which has come true. Their power play has surprised, I think. Uh, it wasn't great all season, but we knew they had some deadly weapons, and they've come out and, and they've been very well. The Ducks penalty kill again. We, we said it was a strength, but... It was relied heavily on goaltending, and, and that's been exposed. The goaltending, I think, has been pretty even, despite the Ducks getting outscored, what, 14-2-3 to th- in this series. I feel like a lot. John Gibson has been hung up to dry a lot. Uh, Martin Jones has been good, but I feel like they've been equally as good, just the teams in front of them have played completely differently. And the defense, I, I feel like the Ducks have just felt the loss of Cam Fowler, which is something we, we said could happen. But they looked good, honestly. I, I mean, the power play connects early and they finally have Raquel shooting the puck from the circle uh 85 games into the season he is <laughs> he's finally in a spot where we thought he'd be all year on the power play as a trigger man uh, and he wires it past Martin Jones and, and that looked like things were going well I mean up until the second goal which was early in the second period the Ducks were playing very good hockey there shooting San Jose 14 to 8 and then Montour just blows a tire and Don Square and Kane go on a two-on-one and they score and the Ducks shocked a little bit, but they, they continued to play pretty well after that. And they were still shooting San Jose 17-10. to 10. And then a, a shot rims around the boards and it creates another two-on-one with Don Skoy and Sorensen. And they score. And from here on out, the Ducks just gave up. I mean, they were shell-shocked. They were surprised that they were playing so well 
and they were down three to one. And it just got worse from there. And the Sharks ended up scoring three more goals in that period. Eric Fair digs around two Ducks players, roofs at top shelf. Evander Kane ends up walking. Brian Amontoy doesn't score. You've got the Sharks getting their fifth goal on the power play. And then the third period was just a mess where it was a, a, a slew of penalties for the Ducks. All three goals in that period were power play goals for San Jose. And we end up losing this game 8-1. to one. And uh, you wouldn't have expected that if you just watched the first 22 minutes of this game. You would have thought the Ducks would have were, could have got back into this. They're playing, I agree, their best hockey of the series. And they eventually end up losing 8-1. to one. I mean, it's surprising. It's disappointing. I have no idea how they're going to come out in this game. You look at some of the post-game comments. They're saying, well, this next game's do or die. This was embarrassing. We have to do that. Well, you got to look at it and say, well, shouldn't this game have been do, and die, do or die? And this is how you came out and performed and, and, and how disciplined or undisciplined you were in a game that should have been a do or die game as well. So uh, I have no idea. You know, a lot of things that we can talk about coming up in, in this game four, but uh, I have no idea how they're going to turn this around. Yeah, and I think that's the that's the concern. You know, uh, going into game three, uh, I, I said, you know, on Twitter, hey, this this is a must win in game three. And, and you know, it was, uh, you know, just like you said, uh First period, a couple minutes into the second, and look, they looked all right. And then the wheels came unglued in the second <clears throat> after those couple goals. And then, you know, the third period, uh, I, I just think that was probably one of the worst periods to watch because they got so frustrated and got down, got all these penalties. You know, the Sharks just piled on more. The only thing I can hope is, you know, <laughs> we talked about this after game two a little bit on social media is that the Ducks had lost the first two against Edmonton at home. They came back and beat Edmonton in seven. So there was that hope. But then, of course, now we're down three nothing. So a little bit, obviously, uh, of a bigger hole. You know, the only thing I, I'm really hoping, Eddie, is maybe the Sharks just, like, used up all our goals in game three. <laughs> I mean, you know, they scored eight. Maybe they're done. I mean, if you remember back in um, game six against Edmonton, they dropped seven on the Ducks. Yeah. Then they were only able to score one in game seven. So are going to go on a cold streak and and, and not score uh, in game four and, and they're on out. But, I mean, there is a chance. They can come back. We, we You know, we, you and I talked about it before the show. If people remember your favorite team, the Kings, they did it against the Sharks. So, um, you know, they could turn it around. I mean, you know, obviously going to go with the cliches, Eddie, but, you know, period by period, shift by shift, all that kind of stuff. That's what's going to have to happen. But um, going into this game four, uh, do or die they've got to get a good start uh, and I think you know the biggest thing that's been killing them is it's not just taking you know certain penalties here and there and, and obviously some of the calls have been iffy but but the biggest thing is these odd man rushes you're seeing the sharks get these two you know one rushes sometimes guys are partial breakaways whatnot and I think that's been the issue because a lot of people are putting it on Gibson for some of these games there's maybe a couple goals that you could put on them but you got to look at the Ducks system overall, and you got to look at their defense. The defense hasn't been there uh, in this series. And how much do we miss Cam Fowler? You know yeah. what I'm saying, Eddie? Yeah, uh, he's an extremely important player on this team, and it's a big loss for them. But it's something they they, shil- they still should have been able to overcome and made this a lot closer. I, I still think even without him in the lineup, they, if they had a played somewhat close to the hockey they played in the regular season, they should have picked up at least one win by now. Um, right, right. But um, it's a disappointing and daunting position to be in. Only four teams in NHL history have come back and uh, won a series after being down 0-3. Most recent one was, of course, the Kings over the Sharks in 2014. If you want to take some solace in that series, the Kings got uh, lit up in games 1 and 2, 6-3 and 7-2. They lost game 3, 4-3 in overtime, and then they came back and they flipped the script on the Sharks and ended up scoring 18 goals in the last four games. That was a special Kings team back in 2014, so it's hard to compare. But they were also a team that had struggled with goal ten- or with uh, sorry, not goaltending, with goal scoring in the regular season, just like the Ducks did. So it can happen. It's possible. It's not over till it's over, but uh, it's not the position you want to be in. Uh, I mean, there's two teams currently down 0-3. It's the Kings to the, the Golden Knights and the Ducks to the Sharks. The chances of any of them coming back are, are slim to none. I mean, we'll still, wa- I'm sure we'll all still watch Game Four and hope the Ducks can at least get a win and, and maybe gain some momentum to get back into the series. You have to remember too, they still do have two games at home, 
uh, after this game if they do win. So it helps a bit. <laughs> it, it doesn't help a lot, but it, you've got two of the last three at home. If you can at least win those and then maybe pick off that last one against the Sharks, you've got a chance. But uh, it would be amazing. It would be a comeback for the ages for the Ducks, just the way they got hammered in all three of these games. They haven't really showed any signs of life whatsoever. For for them to come back in the series, they not only have to play amazing and probably play better than they did in the regular season, the Sharks just have to completely collapse. And they've also shown no signs of doing that. I mean, the offense is there. You would assume if they if they were slumping a bit, Joe Thornton would find his way back into this series if they lost maybe even the next game or the game after that. He would find his way back in, and that would be a whole other mess you have to deal with up front for the Sharks. Uh, goaltending would have to fall apart for them as well. Martin Jones would have to just completely fall off a cliff. There are so many things that would have to go right for the Ducks. It, it just doesn't seem possible. But I'll, I'll hold on hope until they're, they're good and done. Uh, I really want to see them just play a good game. Go out there. I know it, it's cliche, cliche, but go out there, have fun, play some hockey. Your season's on the line. Play like it. Play like it's on the line. Don't play like you did in, in Game Three, where you were. It, it was should have been a do or die game, and you ended up getting hammered eight to one. Uh, they need to have a hot start, like you said, and they can't get frustrated. The discipline has to be a lot better as well. Yeah, and I think you know it. it just, I'm not saying that we were right, Eddie, but in the series preview. I think one of our number one concerns was the Ducks playing discipline. And yeah. that's been an issue in every single game. Like I said, you can sit there and look at some of these games and, yeah, there's some iffy calls and, yeah, there's some non yada, But you got to look at the way that the Ducks are getting frustrated, taking, you know, extra penalties, um, you know, you, you know, just trying to do unnecessary hits. You know, you saw that with uh, Perry in game two. I, I was frustrated. I mean, I think somebody wasn't wearing their chin strap probably as tight as they should have been. But at the same time, you know, you have a play where the, the puck's against the boards. The, the other Shark player's not even really, you know, in there. And Perry goes and, you know, goes to level the guy. I mean, obviously the guy uh, went down a little bit easier. But still, I mean, there's no need to go do that. There's, you know, you're down by a goal in that second game. You got, you know, a little over three minutes to go. You know the refs are calling stuff, you know, pretty pretty tight, at least against the Ducks, as we all talk about. But, yeah. I mean, there's just things like that you can't do. There's no reason to go hit that guy. I mean, you know, or barely make contact. He's not even the one with the puck. There's other guys in there. So that's been my biggest concern, um, and that's what unfolded in these three games. So, uh, you know, for game four, uh, we will have a watch party still. Uh, you know, if you want to you wanna come and hang out, there'll still be some giveaways, things that we're going to do. We'll be at El Ranchito. Um, if you don't want to swing by there, the Ducks are going to have their official one at Honda Center. So you can go over there and hang out with even more Ducks fans. Uh, either way, there's those two options to watch the game. So, you know, I will be watching all all of it, do or die, whatever is going to happen on, on game four. But uh, as far as, you know, the biggest concern now is, you know, what, you know, what kind of changes are they going to do? You know, how is everybody going to adapt and try and overcome it? And like you said, the Ducks not only have to do a lot, the Sharks have to, you know, mess up. Uh, we did get news that, you know, some players were called up. Uh, Bear was called up and also Jacob Larson. Uh, we had some fan questions about that, asking, you know, uh, who's going to play? Are we going to see them? Uh, Carlisle's press conference that he had uh, after practice, uh, he talked about them both being available. Uh, you know, as far as the lineups go, uh, we also had Cole that asked, too, about, um, you know, if we see Troy Terry in there. Um, I, I don't know what we're going to see in this lineup for this final game. I, you know, of those players that are coming up, I think Larson could be an option, Eddie, with the way the defense has gone. Um, Barra, I don't think so much. I mean, I still think you're going to end up going with Gibson. I know some people are, you know, upset about, you know, some of these goals with Gibson, but I don't think putting Miller in is really going to change. I mean, it's the Ducks system overall that's been having some issues, but I think Larson could give a boost if he's put in that lineup for game four. Yeah, I, I mean, I've wanted to see him all season, and we get possibly the last game of the Ducks season that we might see him play. Uh, you, you always see this, though, in, a, in a, a series where a team's down 3-0, 3-1. You see some changes where maybe some young guys come in the lineup, maybe the backup goalie goes in net. Um, I would like to see Troy Terry in, but unfortunately it doesn't look like he's going to go. Uh, I, he was in practice today, but it still doesn't look like he's going to be an option to play just because... 
Randy Carlisle usually likes to go with a guy like Jason Chimera, Antoine Vermat, Chris Kelly, those guys. Uh, I feel like he would add a lot. I mean, adding Jakob Larson, I think, is going to be big. Um, I, I, we don't know, though. He's an unknown quantity at this point, right? I mean, we the, the small sample size we had of him was two years ago at the beginning of last season. And, uh, yeah, so... I mean, we, we have to wait and see what he can do. I feel like he's probably a better option than having Andy Walensky over there. I'd like to see him paired with uh, Brandon Montour, keep Lindholm and Manson together, and maybe have Boschman and Pedersen down on a bottom pairing, which, again, isn't ideal. Or maybe you switch it up and keep Boschman with Montour and have um, Larson down there with maybe BX or whoever they decide if BX is healthy. I, I don't know. They have a lot of options. I feel like Larson is a better option than some of the guys they've already had in there. But it, he's not a he's not a series breaker. He's not a game breaker. He's not a guy who's going to come in and win you a series. Um, Miller, uh, I could see him starting because that's a lot of teams always like to do that when you're down 3-0 just to cha- change things up a bit and get the see if uh, having a different goalie in there gets the guys going. So we could see that, but Gibson has not played bad. I feel like he still deserves the crease the way he's played, but again, you never know uh, what the guys that can do to a guy's confidence, especially losing 8-1, and, and Miller was a part of that as well. He ended up letting in the last three goals in the third period. But uh, I don't know, man. I mean, it, it's going to be interesting to see the, the way the lineup set up. If I had my way, I would want Troy Terry, Jakob Larson in there. I'd still probably have John Gibson in that, but uh, you can make an argument to maybe throw in Miller just to switch things up and, and have a little bit of a different look there. But it's going to be interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll still be watching. Like you said, you'll still be watching. We'll have the watch parties. Um, but uh, something's got to change. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be an interesting game for sure. And, uh, you know, don't forget, too, even af- after the game, no matter what happens, you know, Patrick and, and Eddie, too, will have the postgame show on Forever Mighty. So we'll still have that. And then, of course, Eddie and I will have a postgame show or uh, a podcast after uh, the series, you know, whether it's it's the Ducks and Seven like Eddie predicted, you know, that's what we're all hoping now. Still have some hope. <laughs> yeah, that's the only that's the only choice we have now in our, our, our prediction that we had because mine's gone. Obviously, it's not happening in six games. So um, we'll have those to, to look at, too. And then as far as this lineup goes uh, for game four, uh, basically, Carlisle said in his little, um, you know, meeting with the press that he's not really going to decide until the morning uh, or day of game four. So yeah. we don't really know exactly what he's going to do. Uh, I agree with you. I would like to see Larson in there and Terry. Uh, but I think of the of the two, maybe Larson gets to get you know get in there. Um, something's going on with BX that we don't know 100%. I haven't really seen anybody talk about it, but uh, he's listed on the IR on the Ducks website, so I don't know if it's his hand again that's hurting him or whatever, but um, nothing has come out. So I, you know, I don't think he's going to be available for game four. That's maybe why we do see Larson. The situation, I, I feel the same way that you do, Eddie. I, I mean, I, I don't think Gibson should get the boot. I don't think he's been that bad. I know some of you out there are, are you know, ready to hang him. But um, maybe you do see Miller, like you said. Maybe they do try to change it up. And, and I'm thinking there, there's going to be some changes in the lineup, no matter what, for game four, for sure. Um, but I would look for uh, Larson to come in. Uh, maybe Miller gets switched in there, and then the offensive lines. I, I think there's going to be some some you know juggling going on a little bit because what's been going on hasn't been working so far, Eddie. And I mean, you got to pull out all the stops now. And I mean, other than a couple periods here and there uh, in the series, the Sharks have owned this series. I mean, we just, I mean, this is just fact. That's the way it's been. Um, uh, but a, a lot, like you said, has got to go right for the Ducks, and I think there's going to be some shakeup for Game Four. Um, all we can hope for is that they get a good start, you know, play discipline, and maybe put in some of these younger guys, and uh, just you know, go all out. I mean, that, that's all we can really do at this point, Eddie. Yeah, uh, it's man. It, it, I've. <laughs> Last night was a journey talking about this game, and uh, I mean, I couldn't believe that people actually wanted to come and listen to us break down that game. We went through the, the, the breakdown pretty brief because I don't think anybody wants to hear us continue to talk about an 8-1 loss, but you right. know, the, the outcome of this game is going to be interesting because we did get a lot of questions about Randy Carlisle and about Bob yep. Murray and yep. what, what it's going to look like next season no matter what. Um, Yep. The sweep obviously looks a lot worse than even losing in five. Uh, I'll get your opinion first because we had a lot of questions. We can get into some direct fan questions, but I just want your opinion on, on what you think 
is going to happen to Randy Carlo or Bob Murray if the Ducks get swept, even if they lose this series, which obviously looks likely at this point. Yeah, I, that's part of the reason why I think I turned off my social media after yeah. Game 3 because, you know, every, everybody was coming out with, with the pitchforks and the darts and handguns and grenades and whatever else you want to you want to talk about. I mean, everybody was, you know, calling for blood, basically. And, and I'm not saying it's not without good reason. I mean, if you're mad right now about the way the Ducks have played and, and you're pissed off about uh, management and certain things, I'm all for it. I mean, you have every reason to, to be upset. Um, I think I'll start with with Murray, and uh, you know we've kind of talked about him at the trade deadline, Eddie, and I think that's kind of been the issue. Is we like what he does at the draft, but he hasn't really done too much at the trade deadline lately, and I think that's kind of what the rub is at. If you look at Murray, um, you're happy, you know, in the summertime with the things that he does, mm-hmm. and sometimes you know maybe the mid season things that he does, just like the. Um, Henrique move, you're kind of happy with that. But then, you know, trade deadline, nothing big happens. Uh, you and I talked about this. The thing that upset me at the trade deadline wasn't so much that the Ducks didn't go out and get uh, big players. But the thing is, is they didn't get Kane, and then Kane went to San Jose. And, you know, I think that's what we were worried about, is what players were other teams in the Pacific Division going to get? Yeah. And, you know, we saw, we saw your boy Tatar go to Vegas. You know, we, we saw Kane go to San Jose. You know, um, the Kings got a few, you know, a few players too and whatnot. And I think that's the frustrating part. And I think that's where the fans have a legitimate concern is that it seems like in the last couple of years, uh, you know, Murray's made some decent moves, but it, it seems like when it comes to trade deadline and, and making that push to the playoffs, that there hasn't been, uh, you know, enough done to get the Ducks over that hump. So and that's how I feel with Murray. Um, you know, whether or not he gets fired or not, I, I don't know about that, but I, I just feel like not enough change has been made with this team. I think part of it is you're locked in those contracts with uh, Perry, Getzloff, Kessler. You know, obviously Kessler's been hurt this year, so, you know, some of that's going to come into play. And I think a lot of the, the injuries are going to come into play, you know, shifting over to the Carlisle side. Whether or not he's back or not, I think, you know, it might be a little bit of a scapegoat because there's going to be, you know, the discussion about how. We know the Ducks had the most man games lost in the NHL period, you know, and they had the, you know, the, the first three, four months was just ridiculous. But yeah. Carlisle did keep the team together, did, you know, make a good push at the end and get into the playoffs. Obviously, in the playoffs now that, you know, getting smoked. But um, I think part of it is between the two, Eddie, is there's just not really an adaption to the way the game is, is played today. Uh, we've seen this over the years, all the new interference, you know, type rules, the goalie interference, the hookings, the holdings, you know, a lot of the stuff, the way the NHL was 10 years ago, isn't the way it is this, you know, now in the present, a lot of it's about the speed game. You look at Pittsburgh and the things that they've done. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think that's the overriding issue, uh, you know, is that we just haven't adapted to that game as far as in the management level, they haven't really done what we need to do to compete with the style of play come playoff time regular season they're fine but we've seen this every year we you know we end up doing great in the regular season you know obviously this this year they didn't end up first but they ended up in second and then we collapse in the playoffs and I, I think that's partially the problem is that um of the two i don't think both of them are going to get fired i know people are calling for their heads or whatever I, I think of the two the one that's more in the hot seat in my mind would be murray because Carlisle's only been here the one year. And like I said, they're going to point towards the injuries, yada, yada, yada. But uh, that, that's where I lean, Eddie. Um, I think they're both probably going to be back next year. I don't think they're going to be fired. But if, if we put out, we should, probably should put out a poll question. We put out a lot of them. We probably will do it, hopefully, if the Ducks do get past this <laughs> round. But, but when, whenever the playoffs are over, we will put out a poll question, see what you guys think. And yeah. we've done that. But that's where I'm leaning, Eddie. I, I think... If you if you're gonna aim the blame, uh, I'd put most of it on Murray. Yeah, I, I I tend to agree. I think it's a mix. Um, you know, all 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 the blame for the construction of this team is on is on Murray because they have been set up uh, as a team that that almost plays a style that's it's kind of gone extinct in the NHL to some sense. They're a big right. physical, heavy Western Conference team that that worked up until about a couple seasons ago. 
And, and, and it doesn't necessarily work, especially against teams like we'd talked about matching up with Vegas would have been a nightmare. I mean, even the Sharks are a quicker team than the Ducks as well. And uh, it, it's tough because, you know, they are against the cap, and a lot of that has come from the guys they've signed earlier on when, you know, when this team was built for a style that worked. You know, they're a heavier team. They brought in Ryan Kessler. They obviously re-signed Getzlaff and Perry, which at the time it made sense to re-sign them long-term because of, of how well they were playing. And, and now they're up against the cap and there's not a lot of room to really make any moves to, to change around how this team plays. So they're kind of limited there. The big blame for me on, on Murray comes at the, the fact, especially at this deadline, where he thought uh, this team was, was good to go because of the injuries he thought they didn't need yep. to add. You saw a bunch of other teams adding. And he just doesn't seem to be willing to give up the assets he has to uh, make this team better. I mean, the, I was surprised with the Votnid for Henry trade in the middle of the season, but that was almost a necessity. You had to kind of make that trade to get the Ducks back on track to even get close to making a playoff spot. And then you would think, well, maybe at the deadline he's going to do something to bring in somebody. We had talked about Ian Cole at the time, how that could be a good depth defenseman pickup for the Ducks. It would only cost about a third, second round pick. Evander Kane ends up going for a like a C-level prospect, a second-round pick, and I can't remember the third piece, but it wasn't anything big. That second round obviously becomes a first if he signs a new contract, which is still a steal uh, for them. Would have been a nice signing to see him come. Pacioretty was rumored. I mean, all these guys coming in, even if it wasn't a big name, a guy like Thomas Vanek, who's done well with Columbus, was available and would have been a welcoming addition to the Ducks as well on, on their offense and on their power play. So... That's where the blame comes for him, and, and you still have to put a little bit on Randy Carlisle as well because the system that he employs, I know it's indicative of, of the lineup he has and the style of, of players he has, but uh, he doesn't tend to change things a lot. Uh, he, he's pretty much played the exact same style all season for the Ducks, and you still find yourself down 0-3 in a series, and I'm sure he's going to come out with the exact same style in Game 4. But the Sharks have just outcoached them. Peter DeBoer has set up a system. They came in with a game plan. They've executed it perfectly, and it's worked. And the Ducks have had no answers for it, and they haven't showed any signs of really trying to answer it. You know, they were just trying to stick to what got them there and trying to, to roll with that, and it hasn't worked. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what they do in, in Game 4 to see if they can try and switch things up to change and, and change the series and, and, you know, change the tide the way it's going. But I think they're both back, honestly. Um the, the surprising thing is I don't think we see one uh, or the other go. I mean, if, if if the coach goes, that's Bob Murray's decision. So that makes sense. Bob Murray would still be here. The interesting thing for me is I have no idea what the owners are going to do. I feel like they still believe in Bob Murray and he's here. But if, uh, if they decide to let go and get rid of Bob Murray, you would assume Randy Carlisle follows him out the door. Because the next general manager coming in would probably want his choice of a coach unless they, he rides Randy Carlisle out for another season, which you've seen some GMs do in the past. But uh, I feel like if, if Bob Murray ends up getting the boot, I'm sure Randy Carlisle follows him right out the door. Uh, but that signals a whole new direction for this team, and that's almost, uh, depending on who you bring in, I mean, getting rid of your general manager and your coach, uh, that's that almost signals a rebuild for me, really, because you're, you're completely yep. changing the direction of this team. And... Um, you know, it all depends on the general manager coming in, but I think it's a little bit too soon for the Ducks to just give up on Bob Murray. I know some of the things he's done are questionable, but I feel like they still have maybe not one more season as a contender, but I feel like that cup window is probably up, uh, open for at least one more season where they could maybe surprise some people next year. But they have to do some things and, and add some things. And again, with the coaching decision, if you get rid of Randy Carlo, there's so many different avenues you can go, and it all depends on the direction of this team. There's a lot of guys you can bring in and consider as a win now option where maybe you bring them in for one or two seasons to try and get this team to win but they're not necessarily the right option to, to then transition this team through the next period of time where they might not be that good and they're kind of retooling or rebuilding uh, or you could bring up a guy like Dallas Eakins who has done a great job in San Diego but that almost signals a, a rebuild a type of coach you bring in when you are transitioning and when you're moving away from being those contenders you know he's done a lot with the prospects down there and I feel like that's almost signaling a, a, a change in direction uh, from where, where this team is considered to be in the standing. So a lot of things in the works for the offseason that could really change what this team is going to look like, not just next year, but in the future. Yeah, and I think uh, we kind of hinted at that whole rebuild thing, you know, back towards the trade deadline because we were talking about how Murray wasn't trying to sell the farm and, you know, he didn't want a complete rebuild. But, I mean... 
if it if the Ducks go down, you know, in four games, oh uh, man, I, I don't know. I would stand by because yeah, some, something's got to give. I mean, I, I'm obviously hope it doesn't happen. Hopefully, they pull out this game four. Hopefully, they don't play the same style. I think one thing to point out that's been good for San Jose is you look at what they've done in the neutral zone, Eddie, and that's really, I think, been the key in this series. I mean, if there's there's other things in there, of course. There's the special teams we talked about, discipline and all that. But if you look at the way that the Sharks have really limited the Ducks' options between the red lines, I mean, they're, they're you know, they're, or excuse me, between the blue lines, they're, you know, they're stacking up. And they're preventing the Ducks from getting in there. And like you said, you have Fowler that's out. You know, that's some speed you're missing. The Ducks are trying to do, you know, dump it in, go to the corners and whatnot. But, I mean, for a team that doesn't have a lot of speedy options, I, to me, that's what I've seen being a huge problem in this game. Other than a couple periods, the Ducks have been able to kind of get through there and stuff. But that's why, for me, if I look at game four, I put in Terry. I put in Larson. I put in some of these younger guys with the speed and, and try to change the lines and do a little bit because that's where I think the Ducks – I've thoroughly been outplayed is between the blue lines in the series. And if they go down in four games, I really think something does have to change. Uh, I, I think you're right, though. If they do uh, boot out Murray, then that means Carlisle probably goes too. So uh, it's it's a tough situation. I mean, I think Murray still believes in Carlisle, but I don't know how much heat he's going to get if the Ducks lose game four, especially if they get blown out. Um you know, a lot of this you and I are going to have to, to talk about once the season's over and, and, you know, after we see how this series pans out. But, um, y- yeah, they better come with it on game four. And, and I think the best thing to do is to try to use some of the younger guys and use the speed because, you know, the things that they're doing aren't working. And they haven't worked, I would say, for probably six or seven of the nine periods they've played so far. Yeah, uh, it would be interesting to see tonight because I, I believe – yeah, the Kings play tonight. Nobody wants to be the first team eliminated, so the Kings could be eliminated tonight. Um, obviously, you don't want that to provide extra motivation if the Kings win and the Ducks don't want to be the first team eliminated. That's not the type of motivation <laughs> you're really looking for. But um, it, it's it's going to be really... you know I, I've already said this, but I'm thoroughly impressed with the way the Sharks have approached this series and the way yep. they, they have set up and, and really counteracted what the Ducks could bring. The, the Ducks need to find a way to get chances from the slot because the Sharks have done an effective job pushing them to the outside. And yes, the Ducks yep. had 46 shots last night, but not many quality chances that you really thought, oh, that was a great save by Martin Jones. He made some quality, good positional saves, but there was nothing where the Ducks really tested him that much uh, where you're like, wow, you know, he's, he's playing on his game. So I, I don't know how it's going to change, but... Um, if they can break the system the Sharks have, that could win you a couple games if they're they're reeling a bit and not able to kind of counteract with that, what you're doing now. And that's very optimistic because uh, the Ducks haven't been able to figure it out for three games now. And now they've, they're coming down to a game here, uh, an elimination game. And you were kind of expecting them to, to change things up and all of a sudden beat what's been working so well for the Sharks. So I don't know, but uh, like you said, in, maybe introducing some guys like Jakob Larson and Troy Terry to the lineup, switching things up a bit, maybe moving some guys up and down the lineup. It might be time to maybe take somebody off the Kessler line and, and move some th- things around, switch up the matchups, change some things up, uh, You know, try and counteract what San Jose is bringing to the table. That's the only way they're going to win this game. They're going to have to break down what the Sharks have been doing. And that's it sounds so simple. I mean, it, it's such a simple plan. Just beat the, the Sharks at their own game. But it, it's not. So uh, it, it's, such, it's such a big game, I think, for the Ducks and the way this offseason is going to turn out. I feel like getting sweeped is, is so much worse than losing in five. And it obviously looks a lot worse. And, it all, and even the outcome of this game four. I mean, if you lose another one 7-1... And you get sweeped in unenthusiastic fashion. I feel like if you lose in overtime, at least you battled. And you look like you you were trying to get back in the series. And you still lose. But if it was a battle and you lose in overtime, you lose a close one goal game. Then at least you went out with some dignity. But they they can't go out like this. They they can't go out undisciplined. They can't go out getting hammered 8-1. Yeah, and I, I think that's the biggest thing. Like you said, is, is going out you know, and getting blown out. I mean, because they were... 
they were so blown out in game three, you know, in game one to some extent too, because I mean it was three nothing, um, you know, and then obviously uh, the middle the middle game of those three, you know, they had that chance. So I still think they can pull it off. I think that they can uh, win this game and at least maybe force it to game five. You know, can they force it all the way to game seven? Well, uh, you know, I mean, it's it's highly unlikely. Obviously, you talked about it. Some of the teams have done it. You know, your favorite team, the Kings, did it recently. Um, but, I mean, a lot's going to have to go in the Ducks' way. Uh, I really think that uh, there's some changes got to be made. And I'm hoping that that's what Carl is going to do. I mean, we won't know until probably right before the game, uh, like we said. Um, but that's going to be the factor. And if I'm the coach, I'm putting in some of the younger guys. I'm, I'm trying to get some more speed going in the lineup. You know, we had one question about that, you know, as far as like using Cogs more and Montour more as well. And, yeah, I mean, you got to use those guys. But at the same time, the Ducks – it's not even so much what the Ducks aren't doing. It's like you said, it's what the Sharks are doing. And they're clogging up the neutral zone. They're When the Ducks do get the puck through, the Sharks are pushing them to the perimeter. And, I mean, like that, then it's good. they are going to go down to four games. I mean, if you're not able to get those passes, you know, in the neutral zone done, and you're not able to crash the net, which, you know, we've only seen the Ducks do it a little bit in this series so far, that's the biggest thing uh, that I think that they need to do is they need to make uh, Jones's life uncomfortable. And like you said, yeah, they got 40-something shots in the last game, but they're not getting these quality chances. They're not getting in front of them. You know, how many times we see people, you know, run into Gibson, run into Miller, and I'm not saying that the Ducks need to go out there and run into them, but, I mean, they got to get in uh, Jones's face and try to make his life uncomfortable and try to get some bounces. And, I mean, that may be what it takes to win game four, Eddie, is that – you know, you keep it a tight game and you, you know, get a deflection or you get a, a bounce off the boards like the Sharks have done on a couple of their goals. And, and that's the difference. I mean, at this point, well, you know, I'll take anything. But, I mean, that might be the way that it has to get done. Yeah. Again, a lot of getting in Jones's face and obviously not in a dirty, undisciplined way. Right. Uh, is the Ducks being able to break down again what the Sharks have said? And I, I know it's sounding like a broken record now, but the, the Sharks are pushing the Ducks to the outside very effectively and the Ducks haven't been able to get into anywhere in front of the net and get those types of chances um, so that that would change things up a bit it, it would rattle Martin Jones a little bit being able to get in there I mean Perry did get close to him a couple times but uh, you know he gave him a, a dirty a bit of a dirty slash at the end of last night's game because of the frustration was boiling over um, so you, you, you know we're not talking about that kind of thing but just you know getting in front of him providing some screens getting some chances in front and, and the big thing is just cashing in on those chances the ducks have had some chances here and there from from the slot and the two that come to mind for me are, are both identical plays where kessler and perry had great chances right in front and ended up hitting the post you know those are ones you have to cash in on the sharks have been catching in on theirs and if the ducks are going to have any chance of getting back in this series any uh because they're, they're going to be limited the chances that they get in high quality situations they're going to have to make them pay because they, they get a few every every now and then in the game that the Sharks aren't able to push them to the outside where the Ducks actually do a good job of entering the zone and setting up for, for those types of chances. So they're going to have to actually cash in on those chances to make the Sharks pay, but it, it's going to be hard. Um, I, I really don't know what they're going to change. I don't want to sound pessimistic, but it, it just doesn't look positive right now, the way they've played. There's no signs that anything's going to change, but... I don't know, let, let's get into the fan questions because I feel like we, we probably have a lot and, and a lot of it's probably centering around Randy Carlisle and Bob Murray, but I'm interested to see what people have to ask. Yeah, I mean, th- that's that's the, one of the big things that uh, people have asked. Is, you know, a lot of not necessarily specific questions, but, uh, you know, the, I guess the biggest one you and I kind of talked about is if the Ducks get swept in four games, do they bring Randy Carlisle back? What do you think? Um, you know, we kind of touched on this, and I think just based off Murray's comments back in um, The Athletic and near the trade deadline where he said, I mean, he pretty much said that uh, this team's a lot better and they've been hampered due to injuries, which is somewhat true. Um, but he believes with Kessler having a full se- or a full off season to rehab, with Patrick Eves being back, um, with maybe some off-season acquisitions to fill out that bottom pairing defense. I mean, the top nine forwards are probably going to be the same and, and just having everybody healthy is going to make a difference. I think in some instances it does, but I, I feel like, you know, even just going to the playoffs here with Cam Fowler being out 
the Randy Carl has a lot of uh, excuses to to get out of him, I and he he has the, he can blame everything on the injuries, uh, and and so can so can Bob Murray to, to say hey, you know we're going to bring this guy back, we have confidence in him, and, and we think we would have done a lot better if our team was healthy. It's a little bit of a cop out, but I, I think he does come back just based on that. Yeah, I, I agree. I, I don't think he's going to go anywhere. I think unless it's a situation like you talked about where they get swept and the Samuels say, you know, bye bye Bob Murray, then maybe something like that. But otherwise, no, I, I don't. I don't really think he's going anywhere. Um, another question too, and this came up from a few different people, and especially after the third period, you know, and, and this has come up. I would say maybe a couple seasons ago, but now some people are, are suggesting, okay, you keep uh, Carlisle, you keep Murray. What about Getzloff and his you know, effectiveness as a captain? What do you think? Do you think that you know, they should change it up next season? Do you think he's you know, kind of lost it a little bit? I mean, obviously in the third period, that's not what we wanted to see from him, you know, going off on the refs, taking these penalties. Um, clearly the frustration set in deep in the whole team. But do you think uh, that that might be a change maybe coming next season? No, no. I, I mean, we've seen this before. Uh, it's the same narrative that comes up anytime Getzloff struggles, especially in the playoffs. I, I don't know, remember if it was last year or the year before that, but all that talk around Ryan Kessler possi- possibly being the guy who could be the next captain for the Ducks because of Ryan Getzloff's play or whatever it was at that time, I don't really remember. But, it, of course, it's resurfacing now with – his frustration boiling over last night, getting ejected from the game, and, and people thinking that you know he's not a worthy captain. Uh, I mean, a couple weeks ago, you know he was leading this team to second in the Pacific Division, was the best player all season for the Ducks. Obviously, was hurt at times, but he ended up finishing with like 61 points in 54 games. He's he's the best player on this team, and he's the best candidate for for captaincy on this team. There's a reason he's the captain, and I don't think. Again, I've already, I, you know, I'm, I'm always going to say this no matter what, as long as he's part of this team. He, he's the guy that deserves to be captain on this team. He's the leader of this team. And I, I don't think taking away the captaincy or saying he isn't an effective captain is, is fair at this point because, you know, it's, it's not on him that the Ducks are where they are at this point. He hasn't been great, but a lot of people haven't been great either. Yeah, and I, I think that's not the change that that needs to be made either. Uh, you know, to me, maybe there's some changes with the alternate captains. You know, we've talked about that before. M- maybe you see some changing with that. Like maybe Perry's not one. I know that's been a concern um, that we've talked about that before. That's something I might see. Maybe, maybe you switch it up a little bit as far as who you're going to pick. Obviously, you still keep Kessler in the mix there, but um, that's something that I could see them doing in the offseason. But, yeah, I, I don't see them, you know, you know, just saying, okay, we're going to change uh, with Getzloff, and that's going to be um, the key for that. So, those are, I mean, those are a lot of, you know, questions. I mean, that uh, I think <laughs> we're going to have to talk about in the summer as far as the management and coaching and things like that. I mean, those are all the big issues. But, um, you know, we're going to, if the Ducks can push this, <laughs> you know, uh, hopefully to game six or seven, we'll try to have another. Uh, podcast uh maybe before one of those games if not then eddie and i'll be back for the uh, the uh, i don't know the depressed ducks and pucks podcast <laughs> i don't know what we'll call it like the, the series the, season uh, recap off season preview i mean i mean we'll have yeah. we'll have one of those shows and then we'll we'll be back yeah. with our draft yeah. and free agency preview later down the road closer to that time but we'll I mean, the, the summer is always difficult to get out shows every week, but we'll try our best, uh, depending on the news that's available and depending on what happens. I mean, obviously, if Carlisle gets fired or, or something happens with Bob Murray or, or the Ducks do something to come back in the series, we'll have more to talk about. But, uh, well, we'll have shows. We'll still have shows. We'll still be here uh, every now and then throughout the summer to keep you guys informed. Yep, absolutely. And, I mean, all we can do is, like we said, one shift, one period of time. Hopefully the Ducks come out strong game four and get it going. And hopefully we're back still talking about them in a week. Uh, Until then, let's go Ducks.